My name is Vanessa Karaker and this is episode number two of the Underwater Filming Tips series. If you want to see episode number one, just click the link above. In this episode, we're going to be talking about buoyancy. We're not going to be talking about the buoyancy of you as a diver. That should be perfectly in place before you think about bringing a camera underwater. If your buoyancy is not good, then that's going to automatically result into shaky footage. Because if you as a diver can't stay still on the water, then your camera for sure won't stay still. Also, you don't want to be bashing around the reef and damaging the underwater environment because you as a diver and a filmmaker have to treat the underwater world respectfully. Well, humans in general should do that. But we're not talking about marine conservation, that's a topic for upcoming videos. In this video, we're gonna be talking about the buoyancy of your underwater camera housing and how to achieve the perfect buoyancy. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. We're gonna be uploading episodes from the series on a regular basis. Hit that bell button to be notified when we upload those videos. So let's dive right into it. So why is the buoyancy of your underwater camera so important? If your camera housing is too positively buoyant or too negatively buoyant, it's gonna pull you in either one of those directions. So you're gonna be using muscle power to pull down or pull up the camera throughout your whole dive. And you're gonna be fighting against your camera all the time. As you know from holding weights, as soon as you start to flex your muscles, you start trembling and that trembling motion is gonna be transferred to your camera. And that will result into shaky footage. And this is why it's so important to have a perfectly balanced housing. And on the side note, there's a positive side effect of having a perfectly balanced housing. You can actually let the camera go right in front of you underwater and you don't have to worry that it's gonna drop down to the seabed like a rock or shoot up like a balloon. So if you have to let the camera go underwater for whatever reason, um, you're on the safe side. Also a big advantage of having a neutrally buoyant housing is if you go diving with two underwater cameras, then it's easy to swap them out and you don't have to be dragging them up and down and when you want to change them with your body or whatever, it's, it's not a big deal because you can just let the cameras go and just sort of like push them over underwater. So how do you know when your camera is perfectly buoyant? Now in this video, I'm gonna be talking about my opinion and what I have found to be best for my setup. For you or others, that might totally be different. What I have found out and learned is this. You want to be able to let the camera go right in front of you underwater. And it will just stay put. It won't float up, it won't drop down, it won't tilt forwards, it won't tilt backwards, and it won't tilt left or right. Everything will just stay steady right in front of you. This is what you're trying to achieve. Well, at least that's what I try to achieve when I set up underwater camera rigs. You want to have the camera set up neutrally point so that you can just push it with your fingertips. Now, this is not something you're gonna achieve in one go. This is gonna need some trial and error. But I'd recommend you to go through this whole procedure to get the buttery smooth shots at the end. It's absolutely worth the effort in the beginning. And with that information, you can try to set up your own underwater camera rig. And just be aware, every system is different. You might need to adjust things here and there to make it work for your system. The buoyancy of your housing is gonna depend on a few things. The size of your housing, the weight of your housing, the weight of the camera, the batteries, the lens you're gonna use, the ports you're gonna use, if it's glass ports, acrylic ports, dome ports or flat ports, if you're gonna use an external monitor or not. And last but not least, the weight and the amount of video lights you're gonna use. And with underwater camera housings, size does matter. Just imagine your underwater housing is a boat. The smaller it is, the more agile it is. But then again, the more unstable the whole system is. It's like comparing a raft to a cruise ship. It's essentially that simple. The bigger the housing is, the more surface area it has, and it's gonna be a lot more steady underwater, and you can push it through the water column, and it'll be nice and smooth. And of course, both have their benefits. If you have a smaller housing, it's easier to travel with, you can get into tighter shooting areas, and it's a lot cheaper. And the bigger ones are obviously more expensive and need less tweaking. At the end, it just depends on what camera you have and what you want to do. So if you're using a standard camera, like a DSLR, a mirrorless system or a digital camera, you're going to have a smaller housing and you're going to have to trim and adjust that buoyancy. So how do you trim the buoyancy? To trim the buoyancy, you're going to need floats. For this, 
Floats are essential. As I mentioned in episode number one, floats come in all sorts of sizes, shapes and materials. But the main difference between all of those floats is the buoyancy value. So the flotation power, if you will. So let's say you have an underwater housing and the housing is 500 grams negatively buoyant underwater. You're gonna need a 500 gram float that will make the housing neutrally buoyant underwater. And as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, leave a comment in the description below, flotation measurement is actually made in fresh water. So just keep that in mind. Next up is the M setup, as I call it, and why not to do it? So now you know you need floats, but how do you combine all those floats to get the perfect buoyancy for your housing? When you buy your first underwater setup, the shop might advise you to get the typical M setup. With that setup, you have a lot of flexibility for your lighting, you can move them around, you can spread them apart, but that's not the ideal setup for you as an underwater filmmaker, at least as a beginner. Now there's nothing wrong with that setup. In my opinion, that's just not the perfect setup to begin with. And we're talking about underwater video and not photo. Myself, I started out with that setup and I have found that it's not really easy to handle. Now with underwater photography, on the other hand, you actually want to have that kind of setup. You need the possibility and flexibility to move those floats and arms around with your strobes for creative reasons and to avoid backscatter. Backscatter are the particles in a water column. So when you fire those strobes, you're gonna light up all the backscatter and that's gonna reflect into your camera. So you're gonna have like an underwater snowstorm on your image. And for that reason, you can position the strobes at different angles to avoid that kind of backscatter. You can achieve the perfect buoyancy with the M setup, but this is a topic we're gonna be discussing with pro underwater photographers in upcoming episodes. We're not talking about the buoyancy itself, we're talking about the balance of the whole system. Your setup can be neutrally buoyant, and when you let the camera go, it might just tilt or, you know, be totally crooked, but it will float in front of you and the balance is off. And that's what we're gonna try to achieve in this video, that your system is neutrally buoyant and the balance is perfect. So that's what we want to achieve. With video, you're gonna have moving shots like flybys over the reef and everything. And to achieve those smooth shots over the reef or anywhere on the water, if you're fighting against your system and something is crooked and you have to constantly you know, push it back to being straight, you're gonna have shaky footage. So it's a lot easier if the system is perfectly balanced and you're just pushing it and it's straight and you're just pushing it through the water column. And I have found it's really difficult to achieve that with this M setup I'm talking about. If you're doing underwater photography, it's a bit more forgiving because you have to keep the camera stable for one shot. But with underwater video, you have to keep the camera steady for a period of time. So let's get back to your setup. You want to keep the setup as compact as possible for the beginning. Don't spread the floats and the arms way apart because that's gonna make a whole unstable system. Try to keep it close together. Eventually, of course, you're gonna have situations where you want to spread the lights apart, where you want to have them further away from the camera for creative reasons, also to avoid backscatter and video, or, you know, just lighten up a wider range, a wider scene underwater. But it's really important to focus on to get the steady shots first before you start with the creative stuff. Then you can start to experiment once you have the setup that works for you and you're more experienced. We're gonna get to that in future videos. It's just so important to get the steady shots first. And the reason is your viewer is gonna subconsciously judge your work by how stable and smooth your shots are. If you have a bit of backscatter or your lighting is not 100% optimal or your shots are not as creative or you're a bit under or overexposed, it's a lot friendlier to watch that than watching shaky footage, like GoPro footage, and you become seasick while watching it. So first, make sure that everything is stable and then you can start to work on the perfect image. Then you can become creative. Now, why do you want to keep it as compact as possible? Why do you want to avoid space in between all the parts of your underwater camera housing. The big underwater camera housings 
don't have any gaps in between. It's like one big surface. And that's what you want to try to imitate. A big compact mass with no gaps in between. Obviously you can have gaps in between, sure, but just try to keep it compact. How many times did I say compact now? <laughs> try not to use long float arms. Try to use smaller and shorter float arms that are thicker, that have a higher buoyancy value. There are plenty of choices on the market. A lot of manufacturers have those. Just talk to your camera store or search online. Get all sorts of different ones and then you can try to build the system and see what works best for you. Now, underwater housing and port manufacturers, also the video light manufacturers, provide information on the websites how much the products weigh underwater. So if you want, you can do the math and calculate and get the floats accordingly. And really important is to ask around, talk to people that have the same setup, the same camera, search the internet and see what systems different people use. So once you have chosen your floats, you have to fine tune the whole setup. And the best way to fine tune the balance and buoyancy of your housing is in a pool or in a lake nearby or essentially any water that is accessible to you. But do that before you go diving with the system for the first time, and especially before you go on a dive trip. This will help you to have the setup trimmed beforehand and will save you a lot of time on location. It's important to know that ports affect the buoyancy and the balance of your housing. So it depends on how much air you have in your port. If you have a big dome port, a glass port, an acrylic port, or a small flat port. So it's the amount of air that's gonna make the difference. Usually what will happen if you have a big dome port with a smaller housing, it's gonna tilt upwards. So even if you have your setup perfectly buoyant, it can be that it's just tilted upwards because there's just too much air in the front. So what do you do if you have that situation? There's a number of ways how you can level that. You can add a float to the base of your housing and attach them with, for example, cable ties. This will act as a counter float to your dome port. So it's gonna bring the back up a bit so that everything is leveled. But just keep in mind, if you want to use a tripod, you have to access the bottom part of the housing, the base plate. So if you're blocking the threads to the tripod, you're not gonna be able to use a tripod. So instead of attaching the float to the bottom of the housing, you can attach it to the top of the housing. But then you cannot use an underwater monitor. So it just depends on what you want to do and you can be totally creative how to attach the floats. Just keep them compact. The other option would be to use weights instead of floats. You can add those weights to the housing, to the port. For example, car wheel balancing weights. They come in nice little organized weight units like five grams or whatever you get. And they have a sticky side underneath so you can just place them wherever you need to on your system. And the good thing about those is you know exactly how much weight you're adding to your system, but make sure that they don't rust. Mine started to rust even though it said rust free, but I guess they meant not salt water resistant. And the last thing you want to have is something that's rusting on your expensive underwater housing. But of course you can place them also inside the housing, but just whatever you do, keep an eye on them. My personal and favorite solution are rolled lead sheets. These are usually used for construction on the roof. And this was a tip of Serge Dumont, a French documentary filmmaker. These raw lead sheets usually have a sticky side underneath and it lasts pretty long, even in salt water. So what you do is you just cut out as much as you need and start to trim and balance your whole system. You can stack them on top of each other. You can get thicker ones or thinner ones. They come in different sizes. You can just check on Amazon or eBay or even on your local hardware store what they have. The thicker ones won't be as flexible and the thin ones, you can really bend them and just sort of place them over and around your pots. And if you want to be a perfectionist, you can cut them out and weigh them on the kitchen scale and just document how much each little plate weighs so that you know exactly how much you're adding to your system. There are a lot of other ways of doing this too, so you can just be creative, go to the hardware store, see what works to weigh down your system. And on the contrary, if you have to add floats to your system because you're using, for example, two lights on each side, or you're using a flat port with a macro lens and a magnifier, then the whole system becomes more heavier. What I usually do is I just add floats and attach them with cable ties. So you always have spare floats and if you don't have enough possibilities to attach them, you can just attach them with cable ties. And once I'm finished with shooting with the macro setup or whatever, I just cut the cable ties and remove the floats. 
there are far better ways of doing this. For me, it just works just fine. It's a personal choice. Of course, you can buy floats for each setup and each system. And last but not least, be sure that your system is set up for the right conditions. Because if you only have fresh water accessible and you want to dive in salt water, you're gonna to have to bring some weights to weigh your system down because salt water has a higher density, so everything is gonna be more buoyant. And if it's the other way around, you set up the system for salt water, be sure that you can remove weights or add floats in the fresh water. You can of course document all the changes you have made so you can recreate them for every situation and condition. This is something I'd recommend you do at least once so you don't forget everything the next time and you don't have to redo everything when you're on location. I hope this video was helpful to you and gave you a bit of insight on what you have to look out for. As mentioned, this is just my way of setting up the rig. There are plenty of other ways how to do it. Just remember, the better your system is set up, the better results you will get. And I'd love to hear how you set up your underwater camera housing. So feel free to leave a comment below. Safe diving, and I will hopefully see you in the next episode.